Welcome to Spoken in Justice, where we put the criminal justice system in the dock. This video is part of our series dedicated to majority verdicts. We have looked at how majority verdicts were introduced in England and Wales and heightened risk of miscarriages of justice linked to majority verdicts. You can watch both videos which are linked in the description below. Today we will be looking as to whether there is any link between majority verdicts and racial or class prejudice. Make sure you follow us until the end to have all the details to reach your own conclusion. In an article by The Guardian published on the 24th of January 2024, the headline reads, majority verdicts in England and Wales brought in partly for racial and class reasons. The article refers to a recent research into majority verdicts in criminal trials by Nisha Waller N. and Naima Sekande, published on the 23rd of January 2024, titled Majority Jury Verdicts in England and Wales, A Vestige of White Supremacy. There is foundation, the researchers say, to believe that the introduction of majority verdicts in 1967 was partly in response to the proposed increase in eligible jurors from different racial and class backgrounds. The research looks at the broader perspective in which the Criminal Justice Bill 1967 was proposed. Just a few years earlier, in 1963, the Morris Committee, led by Lord Morris of Bothy Guest, was appointed and tasked with looking into the qualifications for jury service. The terms of reference were to inquiry into the law and practice in England and Wales regarding the qualification for, the exemptions from, and conditions of jury service, and any other related matters, and to make recommendations. The committee report was published in April 1965 and contained 58 recommendations. The most basic recommendation is that qualification for jury service should be citizenship as evidenced by inclusion in the electoral register as a parliamentary elector. The, the reform states that there is today no tenable justification for the exclusionary property qualification. Let's remind ourselves here that uh, only people who own property could qualify as jurors uh, at that time. And the committee assets as an alternative base, the recommendations put before them repeatedly in evidence that the right to serve on a jury be equated with the right to vote. This was said to be necessary for juries to be a fair cross-section of the community. This recommendation had clearly the potential to widen the jury pool substantially. The research suggests that majority verdicts effectively were introduced as a safeguard to this unprecedented widening of the jury pool, as there were widespread warnings that the widening of the jury pool would have led to a perceived decline in the caliber of jurors with the inevitable inclusion of incompetent persons which, according to the research, were often described as the labouring class and the Commonwealth immigrants. This is more compelling, the research highlights, if one looks at the broader context of the social political climate and anti-racist resistance in the 1960s Britain, which was reflective of a wider public anxiety about Commonwealth immigration, black power and white disenfranchisement of the time. The research concludes that a desire to dilute the influence of coloured migrants on juries contributed to the introduction 
of majority verdict in England and Wales. Now, at a first glance, one point to note is that whilst the Morris Report was published in 1965, the government did not implement its recommendations until 1974. In a, in a question asked on the 21st of November 1966 to the Secretary of State, whether before introducing any legislation to alter the requirement that a jury must be unanimous in its verdict, he will commission a research into the work of the jury system and take steps into implementing the Morris Report, the secretary responded, no, but I'm proposing in the Criminal Justice Bill to implement the recommendations of the Morris Committee as regards of excluding criminals from juries. So there was in the background the Morris Committee indeed. However, in an intervention by Lord Morris of Berthy Guest himself on the 10th of May 1967, he stated, I think we are entitled to ask why this change is now proposed, referring to the majority verdict. We had a criminal justice bill in this house in 1961, which became an act. I do not recall then that it was uh, suggested that the time had come to abandon the system that had for so long lasted. I do not recall that in this house noble lords have been advocating this change. Why has this come about? The noble lord, the Lord Brooke of Cumnor, was good enough to refer to a committee over which I had the honour of presiding. The committee had evidence from a wide variety of important bodies and groups and from important persons. Had we been charged with the duty of making some inquiry in regard to majority verdicts, it could easily have been done so. I entirely agree with the noble and learned Viscount Lord Dilhorn that in any inquiry about jury service, there is the limitation that one does not want to affect the secrecy that binds those who have served on juries. But at least one can get certain facts. We did our work during 1963 and 1964, and we reported in the early part of 1965. Our report was published in, I think, April 1965. Throughout our deliberation, says Morris, if anyone then had thought that the majority verdicts must be considered, our terms of reference easily could have been altered and we could have been charged with the duty of looking into the matter. Therefore, it appears that if there was any link between the Morris Committee and the Criminal Justice Bill in 1967, this was not obvious to many. Was deliberately kept silent? Ultimately, the conclusion of the research was that the introduction of majority verdicts in England and Wales must be contextualised with a social political climate marked by the public anxieties about immigration, black power and white disenfranchisement, which the Morris Committee was concerned with, and ultimately majority verdicts were introduced, in part, the study concludes, on the desire to dilute the influence of newly arrived Commonwealth citizens on juries. Given the very slim evidence presented by the Secretary of State in support of the jury nobbling, said that to have been the very core argument which led to the departure from unanimous verdicts in favour of majority verdicts, we agree that perhaps a more obscure reason for uh, their introduction of majority verdicts in 1967 could be found perhaps on racial or class prejudice. We could also point towards uh, more focus on acquittals uh, that were happening at the time and therefore being tougher on crime 
uh, securing those convictions on behalf of the police could have also been a focus by the then Secretary of State. However, we are not sure that at least on the basis of this research alone, that we could go as far as to assert that the references to women, racialized minority people, and the working class as less capable of performing jury service being still a relic in today's jury system. We hope this series of videos have provided you with compelling insights that may influence your perspective, if not on the reinstatement of unanimous verdict, at least on the inclination for further research and debate surrounding the effectiveness of majority verdict since their introduction. Let us know in the comments below. I hope you found this video interesting and if so, like it and also subscribe to this channel to help us with our mission to humanize wrongful convictions. Also, join our networking hub at spokeninjustice.net to take part in our round table discussions on issues that concern our criminal justice system. We look forward to usher you as we sit and rise in this unique trial. Mm -hmm.